Welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church. Some of you are present here in the church, some on the phone, and some on our website. We welcome all of you. If you came this morning seeking, we pray you will leave having found faith, hope, love, friendship, and Christ. If you are without a church home, we invite you to join our church community. community. Zakia, thank you for your excellent solo. We really enjoyed it. Here are this week's announcements, especially for our phone attendees. Just a reminder that you can hear the service on the phone. No computer is required. Dial 248-216-1657. Saturday, we will be taking down the greens at 10 a.m. Thursday, join us for the Thursday virtual coffee hour. This is like the old meet and greet and Sunday morning after church. Watch for the invitation to the meeting in your email, click the link, and join the conversation. Choir meets at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday. New and old members are always welcome. Join me in the call to worship. All who are weary, come to the healer. Jesus shares my burden and eases my load. All who mourn, come to the healer. Jesus sees my fears and comforts me. All who despair, come to the healer. Jesus is my hope, my helper in the midst of trouble. All who are sick, come to the healer. Jesus is the great physician, the lover of my soul, my friend in time of need. Our scripture lesson today is Luke 13, 10 through 17, the New Living Testament. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her out over and said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her, and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God! But the leader in charge of the synagogue was indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd. Come on those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord replied, You hypocrites! Each of you work on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage, hostage by, by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released even on the Sabbath? This shamed his enemies, but all the people rejoiced at the wonderful thing he did. The word of God for the people of God. Praise the Lord. I am Pastor Maurice Horn, and I serve as the pastor here at St. Paul United Methodist Church. I welcome you to our worship service this morning, and I welcome those who are worshiping online, and I thank you for joining us. Looking at the scriptures, that was read this morning for a subject I would like to use, a changing perspective, a changing perspective. The scripture said that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And while he was teaching, he noticed a woman in the midst of the congregation who had a curvature in her spine, which caused her to be bent over and unable to stand up. She had been that way for 18 years. When Jesus saw the woman, he stopped teaching and called to, to the woman and told her to come here. And then Jesus said to the woman, you are set free from your ailment. And when he laid his hands on her, 
she immediately stood up straight and began praising God. I'd like to illustrate exactly what the scripture was trying to convey to us. It says, when Jesus saw the woman, she was bent over like this. Everywhere she went, all she could see is the ground and raise her eyebrows. She was not able to stand up. Now, I walked around in my house like this for about two minutes, and I tell you, it was nerve-wracking. Can you imagine, for 18 years, you had to walk like that, unable to look at the sky, unable to see the world except from looking at the ground. When I was in Japan, I saw a woman bent over like that, and it made me think about the passage of scriptures. And I tell you, I really wish I had the powers. I wish God had blessed me where I could have told the woman to stand up. But I didn't, so I didn't try. But I tell you, this woman, she had accepted the fact that this is how her life would be. You notice it didn't stop her from coming to the temple. She continued to come to the temple, even though she was bent over and unable to stand up. And when Jesus saw her, he looked with compassion and told the woman to come here. And I can imagine a woman saying in her mind, I wonder, what do he want with me? And when she came to Jesus, he laid his hands on her. And she immediately stood up and began to praise God. Jesus told her, you're set free. And for the first time in 18 years, she was able to stand up. When she stood up, I tell you, she had a different perspective on what life was going to be. Because life was going to be where she could raise her head, where she could look around, and she was no longer confined to the world of being bent over. Now the synagogue leaders, they became furious. And they looked at the woman who just got healed. And basically they scolded her. <laughs> Said, there's six days on which work ought to be done. You could have come on one of those days to be healed. You didn't have no right to come on a sacred Sabbath day to be healed. He basically was saying, I want everybody to hear this because I don't want this to ever happen again. Jesus then intervened, and he called the synagogue leader a hypocrite. He said, you can have sympathy on donkeys and oxen on the Sabbath day. You can untie them from the manger and leave them so they can get some water because they would not be feeling too well to go all day and not get no water. You had compassion on them. He said, don't you think that this woman, which happens to be a daughter of Abraham, have been bound by Satan for 18 years, don't you think she should be free on the Sabbath? When Jesus said this, he put to shame the leaders of the synagogue and all those who felt that this woman should not have been healed on the Sabbath day. Now I want you to know that this woman was just as surprised to get healed on the Sabbath day as anybody else. She was not expecting that. But the compassion of Christ reached out and healed her from her condition. Now, there's a few things I'd like to bring out to help you understand exactly what's going on. The law of Moses said that you work six days of the week and the rest, you rest on the Sabbath day. And the scribes had to determine what was considered work and what was not considered work. So they made this long list of rules and regulation for the Sabbath day. They said you can walk three quarters of a mile and it would not be considered work. But if you walk any further, it would be considered work and you would be breaking the Sabbath day. You can untie your donkey and oxen on the Sabbath so you can walk them to get some water. And that would not be considered work. Because even the animals would suffer if they went a whole day without water. You can even rescue your animals if they fell in a ditch on the Sabbath day. Because if you left them there until the next day, they may die from the injury. They were very compassionate 
and considerate to animals. The religious leaders felt that any situation that was considered an emergency situation could be done on a Sabbath day. But because this woman had a chronic condition and she'd been suffering for 18 years, this was not an emergency in their eyes. And her healing, they felt, could have waited one more day. In that day and time, sickness was considered a result of some sin that you or your parents might have committed. You can see how for 18 years, this woman has been looked down upon society. You can imagine all the insults she must have heard from people for 18 years as they passed by her. I wonder what sin she committed to wind up in that condition. It must have been something pretty bad. Regardless of what many people were saying, this woman accepted her condition and continued to come faithfully to the temple. This woman didn't ask Jesus for healing. Jesus had compassion, and he healed her. When Jesus saw this woman, he didn't see a chronic condition. He saw a woman suffering. He saw a woman been suffering for a long time. This was emergency enough for Jesus. He recognized this woman needs some relief now, not tomorrow. When Jesus called this woman a daughter of Abraham, you can imagine how this must have made this woman feel. For 18 years, she's probably been called everything from a cripple to a freak. She probably was ostracized by everyone because they figured she was guilty of committing some type of sin. When Jesus included her in the family of Israel by calling her a daughter of Abraham, she probably broke down in tears for knowing she has been included in the family of Abraham. Bent over and unable to stand up, allowed her to only consist of in the world that she saw, which was basically on the ground. Her life was full of shame, and she accepted it for what it was. But when Jesus healed her and told her to stand up for the first time, she was able to see a different world than that which was on the ground. She can now see the scenery. She can now see the sky. She can now see the birds that was singing in the air. She can now see all the beauty of the creation of God. These are things she had not seen in 18 years. She now had a changing perspective of how she viewed the world around her. The fact that Jesus called her a daughter of Abraham gave her a new sense of pride. And she was freed from that sense of shame that she carried for 18 years. You can imagine she no longer was shameful because she was a daughter of Abraham. She can now look people in their eyes without feeling like dirt or lesser than a human being than anyone else. She experienced a changing perspective on how she felt about herself and how she viewed the world. For once in a long time, she now feels good about herself. After Jesus rebuked the synagogue leaders and those who agreed with them and showed them how this woman suffered long enough, she shouldn't have to wait another day. She should be loose from her infirmity. He changed their perspective on the Sabbath day. He said, man was not made for the Sabbath day, but the Sabbath day was made by man. When Jesus healed this woman in the middle of a Sabbath day service, he upset the standard proceeding and the, um, for the service, how it's supposed to go. Usually when Jesus shows up, nothing usually goes as it's supposed to go. He always seemed to do something that turns everything upside down. It's amazing how Jesus demanded equal treatment of women who had been inferior to men in the Jewish culture. It was horrible how the women were treated in the days of the first century. The women were seen as useless and a piece of property 
for a man to use and to see as he seemed fit. I once read something that said the Jewish male used to say that it was better to burn the Torah, which was the law of Moses, than to teach it to a woman. Jesus' words and action revealed the equality of the sexes. It's amazing how times have changed, and since the woman liberation movement, many women have been able to stand up and demand for equal rights. And we have a lot, made a lot of progress, and we still have a lot of progress to go. Can you imagine that for almost 2,000 years, Christianity did not permit women in the ministry until the Protestant communities began to ordain women in the last of the 20th century. And the sad thing is we still have churches today that refuse to accept a woman in the pulpit. The question must be asked, why do we think Jesus singled out this wretch woman and healed her and called her a daughter of Abraham? In this passage, does it suggest that Jesus wanted to free every male, female servant and master, Jew and Gentile, from the bondage of equality? Do you think Jesus was trying to instill in the people a changing perspective on the way life should be? We're talking about changing perspective. You know, it's amazing how once upon a time, back in 2009 to be exact, a changing perspective began to happen within the United Methodist Church when they created something called Rethink Church, where we can rethink the way church is, that we can see church not as a place to go, but a place of something that we do. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, everything the Samaritan did was described as a verb. When he saw the wounded man, he was moved with compassion, and he went to him, he banished him, he poured oil on him, and he put him on his donkey. He took him to the inn, he gave the innkeeper money to cover the injured man's expenses, and he promised to return to pay for expenses that might still be due. Looking at the church, it's more than just a place to go. It's something we can do to be the hands of Christ, the feet of Christ, so that we can spread the good news throughout the world that Jesus is alive. In March of 2020, the world was faced with a pandemic called COVID. COVID has literally changed our world. And then we were introduced to new variants like the Delta and the Omicron. And there will still be more in the future. COVID has given us a changing perspective on life. You know, last week I wasn't feeling well. And I didn't think much about it because there's been a lot of time on Saturday I'm not feeling 100%. But ironically, my wife wasn't feeling well neither. And in the midst of all this COVID, the first thing I said is, oh, my God, I hope I didn't catch the COVID. We, we went right on Christmas Day to go get a COVID test. And I called up Pastor, and I said, Pastor, I, 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 I Brent Webster, I... I, I'm not feeling well, and I'm not sure. I don't want to come in the congregation if I got COVID and then tell everybody on a one call, tell all, if you've been in worship these past 14 days, go get COVID tested because I'm tested positive. I didn't want that to happen. So we waited and waited, and when I never got the answer, I said, man, go ahead and go preach. I cannot come into the congregation not knowing if I got COVID. And it seemed like the thought that COVID might be present, I just seemed to get sicker and sicker and sicker. I didn't get my results until 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon that my test was negative and May's test was negative. I said, hallelujah. I had a funeral that night, and I was hoping I didn't have to call up and say, I can't make it because I got COVID. But I was able to be there and was able to give the eulogy. COVID has changed perspective on the world, the way we see the world, the way we enjoy each other's presence, the way we celebrate, the way we do everything, because we have to be careful.
careful. At this present time, I have several family members, entire family with COVID. Friends, the entire family with COVID, vaccinated and unvaccinated. Every time I talk to someone, somebody else has caught COVID. We're afraid to do anything because we can't see COVID. It has given us a change in perspective. My hope to you is that we would just keep looking to God for a healing to take place. That God would touch the hearts of people to protect themselves, get the vaccination, do all that they can, quit hanging out in crowds with no mask on. Until this thing is over with, we have to be careful. We have a different perspective on life. We have no idea what the new normalcy is going to look like. But whatever it looks like, I want to be there. Amen? Praise the Lord. We're talking about a changing perspective. It's amazing. Our perspective has always changed. It changed from when we were a kid to become a young adult. Then when we became a young adult, our perspective changed again. We became a middle age, our perspective changed again. And when we became a senior citizen, the whole perspective changed. We begin to see the world different as we grow. Well, in this story, this woman, she had a change in perspective from being bent over, able to stand up again. So let us continue to move forward with hope, with faith, as we experience the changing perspective each and every day of our life. And as we experience this change in perspective, let's reinvent the wheel. Let's make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Are you ready? I am. Let's do it. A changing perspective. Before I sit down, I would just like to say, last year we had our stewardship campaign, and I had pledged to increase my offering and also to give a one-time gift of $1,000 for the year 2021. And as the pastor, the first Sunday of the year, I'm going to give my one-time gift of $1,000. And the only reason I'm announcing it is because I'm the pastor, and the pastor should always lead the way. But I invite those who have not made a, a, a pledge. It's not too late. You can continue to make a pledge. We'll accept whatever gift that you would like to give us. My gift of a $1,000, I'll put an offering plate. God bless you. As a finance chairman, sir, I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to emphasize it. It doesn't have to be $1,000. If you want to give any amount of money on a one-time gift, that's fine. At this time, we will prepare our hearts to receive communion. We begin by reading the great thanksgiving. Before we begin reading, is there anyone that have not received a communion cup as you entered in? Do any, anyone need a communion cup? <clears throat> I will begin reading the light print and I ask that you would read the bold print. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Let us pray over the communion elements. 
Gracious Lord, we ask your blessings over the bread and grape juice, which is symbolic of communion, O oh God. As we give thanks for this, O oh God, may we ever be reminded of the finished work on Calvary, O oh God. We thank you for knowing that communion, O oh God, is, is, allows us to feel the grace of God. It's a means of grace where we can feel your power, your love, your mercy, and your grace. And God, allow us to extend it unto others, just as you have forgiven us. Help us to forgive others. We give you thanks for this opportunity. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Though we are many, yet by the broken body of Jesus Christ, we can become one. The body of Christ was broken for you. Though we have sinned, yet we can be forgiven for our sin by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. The blood of Christ was shed for you. The communion table in the United Methodist Church is open to everyone. Communion is a means of grace that will allow us to feel the presence, the power, the love, the mercy, and forgiveness of God. If you want to receive forgiveness, then I invite you to participate in receiving communion. If everyone will take your communion cup, and if you kind of rub the, if you rub the front of it, you'll get the little plastic covering, and you can pull it back that will expose the wafer. Once you've pulled it back, you may pull out the wafer. And it takes a little practice sometime with the cups. Pull out the wafer. The body of Christ was broken for you, everyone. Then you continue to pull back, and it would expose the grape juice. The blood of Christ was shed for you, everyone, the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Oh, God, we just give you thanks again for the opportunity to receive communion. You said to come boldly before the throne of grace. Oh, God, we boldly come because we don't deserve this, only by your grace, and we give you thanks. In the precious name of Christ, I pray, amen and amen. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. You go in peace.